Hello, hello. All right, welcome. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. Let's jump right into it. Remember that at the Mount Sinai. And God spoke all... Oh, yeah. So, I obviously, there's this big calamity of lightning and uh, earthquakes and thunder and smoke. And God comes down on the mountain. And this is where we're at. And God spoke all these words, saying... I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, no other gods before. Hmm, it's interesting the way it's worded. Instead of just no other gods than me, no other gods before me. Hmm. Hmm, I don't know. I don't think it really means much of anything other than the fact that don't put anything above God. You know, you can put money, you can put gold, you can put power and prestige, you can put even your search for justice. It could be a virtuous thing, but if you put it ahead of God, anything in your life, if you put before God, even your own spouse, you know, your spouse will die. Your children may die before you. It's a sad thing. But if you put anything before God, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be fulfilled. You're not going to have a true life, you know? Not a life that God intends you to have, at least. Verse 4, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Notice that, you know, again, is God mean? Is he vengeful? No, he's just. The sins of the Father come down upon the Son. This is what he's saying. For those who hate him. It's not for those who are indifferent or don't know him or don't necessarily follow his commandments the best, you know, those who fall short. No, it's those who hate, hate him that he visits the inequities upon the future generations. Okay? Hate is a strong word. You have to really dislike God, basically. You have to be working against God. That's what he's saying. But this is where it's like, oh, he's so mean. Is he? Because right after he says that, he makes clear that he also shows mercy to thousands of those who love me. So even if you're the second generation of someone who hated him and you decide to love him, he then blesses you for thousands and thousands. Do you understand how much more powerful that one is? You have to have the punishment, but the reward for doing good is greater than the punishment for doing bad. Verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Okay, I had a little rant back in my early days on here about how that's not cussing, and I stand by that. I had a guy who, you know, sent me a little message. I rarely read that stuff, but it was insightful to a degree, and it talked about how later in the Bible talks about, you know, proper speech and what comes out of your mouth, and I'm aware of all this stuff, but I appreciate what he was trying to do. My point isn't that you should curse whenever you want and use swear words and say things like, ah, oh, I won't say it on here, but ah, oh, GD or ah, oh, JC, you know, those, that's not polite and it's not showing reverence to God. But that's not what this means. To take the Lord's name in vain is like what we'll see Balaam doing later on. It's using the Lord's name for your own vanity, for your own gains, for your own, you know, whatever it may be. For you. Not for the glory of God. You know, not to pwn on other religions or anything, but you might see this in your founder of certain religions where they took the message of Jesus, twisted a little bit so that they could gain power, or gain money, or gain wealth, or gain a cult following. This is how cults, cults always start with, like, this guy claiming that he's Jesus or that they are Christian, you know, but ends up just want to have sex with all their wives. <laughs> So he's not doing it for God. He's taking the Lord's name, the word of God, the message of God, and using it for his own or her own vanity. Taking the Lord's name in vain. 
Okay, understand the words that they're using. So it's not just, you know, getting angry and saying, ah, oh, GD, you know. That's not nice. That's not good. That's not showing reverence to God. God doesn't like that, I'm sure. But that's not taking the Lord's name in vain. Okay, still, you shouldn't cuss. You shouldn't, you know, <laughs> take the Lord's name when you're angry. But, I mean, it goes back to what is the Lord's name? I mean, the Hebrews would have called him Yeshua, not Jesus. You know, unless I say Yahweh, am I, if I just say, oh, God, darn it. Is that the Lord's name? Is his name God? Do you understand how muddled it gets when you start thinking that cursing or saying, oh, JC, you know, <laughs> that that's the Lord's name in vain? For, and then it deter not only does it muddle it and make it seem silly and petty, but at the same time, it takes you away from what they're really saying, which is far more important. Don't preach the word for your self gain. Don't spread the message for your own self gain. Don't be someone who's just serving yourself. Don't take the message of Christ for your own vain purposes. Don't take it so that you can become rich. Don't take it so that you can become famous or wealthy or get earthly gains. That's the Lord's name in vain. You're taking his message for your own vain, self-serving end. Seems simple. I don't know why people argue with me on it. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. It is in, in, in it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in is in them and rested the seventh day therefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and hallowed it and this goes back to what i said before in chapter 19 how you know the people had to prepare themselves for a couple days to go see the mountains and that's preparing themselves mentally and that's what the sabbath is it's taking that time and remembering that it's holy it's clearing your mind mentally it's taking a break taking a rest you know you see it in it's every Hallmark movie that's ever made. The dad or the mom that works too much and they don't see their kids and life's passing them by. That's what God's saying. Take time every week, a whole day every week. Don't worry about the bills that you need to pay. Don't worry about you know the work that needs to be done. Get all that stuff done ahead of time and take a day to slow down, to remember what's truly important. Spend time with your family. Spend time with God in prayer to rest your body and to prepare for the next week it, it it will make you mentally healthier I mean this isn't even you don't even have to be religious to know this. this is like Tony Robbins stuff you know all the way back in the day motivational speakers this is like you know think and grow rich all these books telling you you know make sure you take time to de-stress and take time for your own uh, well-being mentally if you do that with understanding that it's the Lord's day, if you do that with understanding that you nothing is more important than the Lord, then all this other stress of the week washes away. If you don't take time to remember what the Sabbath means, why it's holy, then you're not getting the benefits of the Sabbath, of the rest day. You have to remember why it's holy. It's holy because it's the Lord's day. Who is the Lord? What is the Lord? He's holy creator. He's righteous. He's just. He's merciful. He's love. Oh, that's right. All these silly things that I stress about are nothing. But if you don't take time to keep it holy, that's not possible. Verse 12. <clears throat> Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. See, that one's very important. Honor thy mother and thy father. Now, I know in today's day and age, not all mothers, not all fathers are worthy of honor I guess and it's a sad thing but that was the case back in these times too and I always equate it to you know I'm not saying my time in the military was wonderful at all times but there are some good lessons and the understanding of a lawful order if you're given an order that's unlawful you don't have to follow it it, it helps you to understand what's going on with God's order of you know God telling you to honor your mother and father so long as they honor God. 
You know, if they're giving, telling you to do something to go against God, you don't have to keep it their ways. And honoring them doesn't even mean that you have to keep it their ways. Honoring them is taking care of them when they get older, is listening to them and respecting your elders. This is honor that you can show them. And <clears throat> again, it doesn't mean you can't disagree. It doesn't mean you can't be at odds with them on issues so long as you are trying to stay on the side of the Lord. If your parents are trying to force you into a way that's against the Lord, you don't have to go with them in that way. And that's not dishonoring them either. As long as they follow the word of God, it's a lawful order. You know what I'm saying? You must follow it then. If they give you an unlawful order, then you don't have to. But that doesn't mean you're disrespectful about it. Just like the military. If you're given an unlawful order and you refuse to follow it, that's fine. But you know, it doesn't give you an excuse to be a prick about it. So understand that and these next few are generic okay you shall not murder obviously you shall not commit adultery obviously you shall not steal obviously all right before we get into the last couple the you i said steal and murder obviously because to me and everyone i think that's pretty obvious the adultery one <clears throat> in today's day and age is seen as like we still know it's bad but it's not as big a deal some marriages are open and all this stuff and you know, is adultery just premarital or just uh, cheating on your spouse or does it include premarital sex because we're such a sexual society? Well, the reason why adultery is such a big thing is look what happens. First off, sex is a bonding thing. You bond with the person you're with. That's why you want to only be with one person or try your best to keep it as close to one as possible. You want to have that one partner that you can trust because you bond with them in a deep way. Because really, sex is the act of creating life. Think about it. It's meant to be a deep thing. When you just make it willy-nilly, it hurts your soul. It really does. It makes you, <clears throat> what is it, Close, eyes to see, ears to hear. It closes them a little bit because you're willfully sinning against the Lord. And that doesn't even go into adultery as far as cheating on your spouse or in having relations with someone who is married, especially if they have kids. Like the rippling effect of sin, you know, that it doesn't just affect you and it affects those around you outward and outward in such a traumatic way a lot of times, especially when children are involved. It's a better way to live. Not only does it hurt people, and that's why it's wrong, but it's a better for yourself mentally you know, in the long run, to live this way than to have partners that you have to either lie about or that will hurt your family, home life, and cause strife between you and your loved ones and your children. Look at the strife caused within the family of Jacob and his brother and his sons and the brothers because they all had different moms, you know, and they and there was a rivalry within the descendants of Jacob because they had different moms and. Adultery. Like, it makes life harder for those around you. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness, false witness against your neighbor. Obviously, don't lie. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. See, this is the, what I always picture when Owen Benjamin is talking about the grabbler. You know, the grabblers. It's the people who want other people's things. You know, the grass is always greener is the saying, but it's deeper than that. It's not just seeing the other thing like, ah, oh, that's nice. Oof, that would be nice to have. Ooh, I wish I had that. That's not necessarily coveting. Coveting is, I want that. I deserve that. You know, it's one thing to see another man's wife and be like, ooh, she's good looking. And it's another thing to be like, oh, I want her for all for myself. I should be the one with her. I should be the one. I deserve someone as good looking as her. I want that person. I want that person person's land. I want that person's wife. I want that person's vehicle. That is coveting. Okay? It's not just acknowledging that something's nice or wanting something similar. It's wanting that specific one of that person's. Because you're basically telling God what you've given me isn't good enough. You know, this isn't the, this isn't what I I deserve more. You know, what are you doing? And again, <laughs> it's a grabbler move. It's a grabbly move. I want it. I want it. I deserve that specific one. Theirs. Not, oh, wow, they got a lot of heads of cattle and it's a 
producing a lot of meat for them. They're making some side money and they get to raise their own food. And all right, maybe I should get into that. Maybe I should look into getting some cattle, you know, of my own, trying to copy what they're doing. That's not coveting. Coveting is wanting theirs, that person's. You deserve it. Verse 18, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They are freaking out. That's all I got to say to it. Okay, there's thunder, lightning, blah, 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 the darkness that Moses walked into to speak to God. And they're scared out of their minds. Okay, they have the fear of the Lord, and they don't even want to hear his voice because they think they'll die. It's too much for them to handle. Verse 20, And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. And that didn't last long. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness with God, where God was. So again, I said it in chapter 19. He, it's a test. He set the boundaries. He wanted to make sure that they would cleanse themselves, that they would be in awe and reverence, that they would understand, and that they would follow him because they, the fear, the reverence for the Lord is upon them. No one would touch that mountain because God told him to, especially once he saw they showed him his awesome power. And they told Moses to go back down there, do a double take on him, bring him these commandments, which he gets down there and they're like, oh, we're so scared. Oh my gosh. Don't even let him speak. <laughs> we'll die. And Moses is like, don't worry. That's kind of what he wanted you guys to think. This was the test to make sure that you had fear of the Lord. Good job. You know, he did this so that you would have reverence for him, to know his power, so that you would follow his commandments and not sin. Unfortunately, that only lasts like, I don't know, for some, probably a few hours. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I record my name. I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stone. For, it, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. All right. <laughs> that last part's funny. Like, don't put your altar on raised steps where people can see up your loincloth. I mean, really, it says your private parts in the New Living Translation. It's just funny that he has to say that. God's like, look. Let's not make this a gross spectacle. No one wants to see your junk, all right? <laughs> okay. But basically, what he, he just says, you know, you pass the test. Thank goodness. Don't sin. And here he's telling them, again, don't make idols. Don't make idols of gold. Don't make idols of silver. For, for one of the commandments is don't carve anything. But remember... He's telling them, don't sin, don't do these things. But right here, he's explaining to them, this uh, paragraph is about how and where to give your offerings, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, to atone for the sins that he knew they would commit. So he gives them the law, he gives them the Ten Commandments, he, he tells them how to live their lives, and he tells them what to do. But he builds in this, it, it, he makes it aware to them that he's aware they're still going to sin. They're still going to have to atone for their sins. You know, there's no where is it ever present where he's like, you can't do this uh, ever, 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 ever without building in a forgiveness package. You know what I'm saying? I think the only unforgivable sin was is it don't deny the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. 
he's always letting you know, look, I know you're going to fall short. Do your very darndest to live up to my commandments. But I know that you're still going to have to ask for forgiveness. Here's how you need to do that, okay? Don't do it by building altars that are fancy. Use the earth. Use the earth and the ground around you. I created it. You didn't create this. There's nothing more glorious than the things that I myself, Lord God, have created. How could you make anything better than what I've made myself? Don't cut the stones yourself. Don't hewn the stones. Don't make an elaborate work of it. Then people will say, oh, wow, what a what an artiste, what an architect. Who put this up? Instead of looking at it and saying, this is for the Lord, they'll look at it and say, oh, that designer was so fantastic. And look at what was going on in the Renaissance. Look at the Gothic cathedrals. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. Is that glory for God? Is it all going to God? The person who built it may have put, tried to do everything they could to put the glory to God, to make this amazing structure in God's glory. But people later on, generations down the road, will still look at it, and instead of revering God, they'll revere the designer. The architect, which, if you're not aware, that's the little, for Wiener Lucifer brothers, Luciferians, D-bags, that's the devil, is the architect. He designs. He can't create. God creates. But the devil designs, and he's the grand architect. Whenever you hear somebody say, like, a grand architect of the universe, it's a Luciferian thing. It's a devil-worshipping weirdo people. It's, like secret handshake. So, I'll get rid of that. God doesn't want any glory going to anyone else but Him, especially when the whole purpose of the altar is where you go to make your peace offerings for forgiveness. You're going to go and ask for forgiveness to something, make sure it's all about the Lord. Make sure you build the altar out of earth and stone, not hewn stone, not cut stone, not gold, not silver, nothing fancy. It's going to give glory to the design itself, but only the purpose of the altar is for sacrifice to the Lord. It's not to make yourself or your people look rich or wealthy or grand. It's to give sacrifice to the Lord. You want to glorify the Lord, live by his law. Don't build him something crazy. Live by the way he told you to live. That's glorifying him as much as he wants you to. Don't try to do something by your own design, thinking that you are wiser than God. No. God created earth. Build it out of earth. God created stone. Build it out of stone. And that's what he's telling them. <laughs> and the whole purpose is, he remember, they're still young in the faith. They have to get it in their heads that God is beyond the material. That what we find value in, God doesn't necessarily find value in. What we find to be uh worthwhile god doesn't find to be worthwhile god's into <laughs> god's into the real world not the perceived what's important world the real world build out of real things build what is real and then lastly <laughs> don't make it so you have to go up on steps so your junk's hanging out in front of everybody that's what it really says which goes to show that that was probably happening you know at other times either out of lack of common sense or lack of courtesy, uh, or just because all these ancient religions worship the phallus, you know, seriously, that's what all the, what the obelisks and stuff are about. <laughs> it's all penis worship. I mean, what's the god of Horus or his father, Osiris, one of them, like had his whole body cut up and then the golden penis was the only part they couldn't find, or the penis was the only part they couldn't find, so they made one out of gold. And, like, it's a whole religion for, like, these ancient cult people. And I'm sure some of the other priests of other gods at the time loved the fact that their junk was hanging out. And God's like, no. You know, maybe you guys are doing it on, gonna do it on accident. You know, maybe you weren't trying to show your junk in front of everybody. But either way, no one wants to see that. Don't do it. Make it flat. Don't make it so the people have to look up to you and see your junk. <laughs> oh, man, you can't make this stuff up. All right, everyone have a wonderful afternoon, evening, or good night. God bless.